The Unshackled Waves, episode 169. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. Now, before we begin the Unshackled show for this week, our followers will have noticed a change. We have a new Unshackled colour scheme of black, white and blue, uh, keeping the existing TU letters and web address. But this means we're saying goodbye to our famous yellow, which polarised a lot of our followers. I know that our detractors like to call it piss yellow, which made me laugh. I originally chose yellow because it was the colour of freedom and liberty, but I'm ready to move on. And so far, the reception to the new skull colour scheme has been positive, so this is a brave new beginning for us. Uh, as such, the logo of this show has changed, and has, as has our visual set, so things are always happening here at The Unshackled, but on with the week's news, and after last week's entertaining political sideshow of David Linehelm versus Sarah Hansen young it was back to hard policy this week with the ACCC's report into Australia's energy market, and we learnt that Peter Dutton had managed to shave off 27000 from Australia's annual migration and a cap uh, to only 163000 a year. Meanwhile, the Super Saturday by-election contests are really starting to fire up, so to discuss all this, I'm joined once again by the Unshackled's political editor, Michael Smythe. Michael, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Tim. Now, as I said in my introduction, it was back to the, the big uh, political issues this week, which uh, I suppose uh, is that's what we should uh, focus on every week, but yeah, the uh, the silly stuff that's always the most entertaining to talk about. Hmm. Oh, isn't it? But I think we've got a bit of entertaining stuff on this week's show as well, as well as the nitty gritty. So I we'll think our viewers will be happy. <laughs> yeah, we'll try to make it as entertaining as possible. Indeed. So, what are we talking about this week, Tim? So we've we had last week the uh, release of the ACCC, the Australian Consumer and uh, Competition Commission energy report into Australia's uh, energy uh, market. And uh, as we all know, the, the energy debate uh, within the, the coalition uh, has been quite fierce with uh, uh, Tony Abbott and his supporters and the Nationals wanting new investment in uh, coal uh, plants or a, as it's known, baseload power. And the, the ACCC uh, seemed to agree. They, they recommended that the federal government uh, underwrite uh, baseload power. Now, this is all in the context as Malcolm Turnbull and the rest of the uh, cabinet uh, try to negotiate the, the national energy guarantee through the states and, and through the parliament. So it was a pretty satisfactory report from the, the broader coalition's point of view. Indeed. And the fact that it's an independent report or deemed an independent report makes it a lot harder for the Labor Party and the Greens to criticise. I mean, the Labor Party and the Greens will criticise it anyway because they love to obstruct. But it makes any attacks on what the Monash Forum and the Nationals are uh, trying to implement look, you know, petty and without any real power. I remember, yeah, Mark Butler saying, oh, this report is, uh, it's, it's just uh, uh, about uh, tr trying to placate the, the divisions in the, in the coalition. And uh, Bill Shorten, when commenting on it, uh, conceded that he hadn't read the report. Now, I haven't... That's a shock. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah. uh, I haven't uh, re read the, the report either, but uh, I've looked at uh, quite, a, quite a number of articles and analysis uh, on it, and and definitely the the main takeaway is is that Australia's energy market at the moment is, is broken uh, because it is such a hard industry to to break into now because uh, it's it's got the the, the big three uh, as they as they're called uh, and obviously they've all been captured by the the green uh, industry. And so they, they want to invest in as many renewables as possible and they're able to squeeze the consumer because it's pretty much the same as what's happening in the, the telecommunications industry. When there's not a separation between whole t wholesale and retail, 
then whoever owns both can just jack up the price and consumers have just got to wear it. Mm. But it's even worse with the energy market than non-existent energy market in terms of energy than it is with telecommunications. Because at least with telecommunications, you can ha you could have, at least in theory, new players rising up and, you know, leasing lines and copper off Telstra, uh, notwithstanding the NBN. But in regards to power distribution, and I, I was listening to uh, Malcolm Roberts talk about this on Sunday afternoon, uh, he was up in Longman um, campaigning for Matthew Stephen, the One Nation candidate, and he made the comment that the a lot of the power poles that have been replaced don't actually need to be replaced. What he didn't say, perhaps what he didn't know, is one of the reasons why they're replacing the power poles is not just to make money, but also to... Uh, make it more the infrastructure more compatible with green energy but the green energy that they're trying to flog off to the consumer who wants to feel good about virtue signaling oh i have green energy i'm not using coal power i'm using green power that's crap they're paying much more for it than they need to and the amount of energy is actually decreasing because while they're trying to move and we discussed this last week i know but while they're trying to trans, while they are transitioning from non-renewable to renewable, so-called renewable power, the lack of energy for distribution and consumption is going to jack up the prices, and it's also going to lead to power cuts. I mean, just look what's happened to South Australia. It's just, it's much worse than the telecommunications industry. Yeah, uh, d uh, definitely is. And so, so what the the report meant by. Uh, governments underwriting uh, baseload power is uh, what I mentioned about assisting uh, new entrants, uh, which uh, now this is where uh, fr uh, free market people, uh, well, not just in the Liberal Party, but in the, the broader business community get uh, a bit freaked out because government getting involved in the uh, the energy industry, or oh, that that's just going to uh, ma make the problem worse. Uh, yeah, if, Going back to the telecommunications example, uh, when the government got back into it, the, the NBN, that's, that's turned out to be uh, a total disaster. But mm. it's always pointed out that government has wrecked this industry with, with so much uh, regulation over the past decade, mainly because of uh, climate change policies, that uh, what uh, the Conservatives in the coalition are arguing, like, look, we need government... Well, intervention assistance to uh, basically correct uh, what uh, Labor and sadly the coalition governments have done and uh, I love the nickname they've been given um, uh, the, these conservatives are Kolsheviks which is <laughs> Kolsheviks that's very droll very droll the problem with the coalition especially being all in favor of you know private enterprise in terms of electricity and utilities menzies never would have said that menzies never ever ever would have supported that and now they've just basically how do i put this politely they have just kicked his corpse in the guts repeatedly and they haven't stopped kicking and that's why they're and that's and they've done that by saying, Oh, we're gonna pander to this green left agenda, we're gonna have everything renewable. Okay, they're not saying everything renewable, but we're gonna transition to everything renewable while we at the, in the, but in a convenient way for us. But what's convenient? People as I've said before, and I'll say it again, I'll have this rant. People are struggling to pay bills for energy, people are struggling to put food on the table, people are living under mortgage stress or rent stress. What's this green energy going to do? It's going to do absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing for us. And the government needs to step back in. And, you know, I don't like big government. I mean, I'm, I'm somewhat of a federalist. But you have to. there are some times when you do need the government to step back in. And this is one of those times. Uh, and critics of this ACCC report have said, oh, the, the real problem is a lack of certainty on energy policy, which... Uh, basically you can interpret as uh, 
there there hasn't been a a carbon pricing scheme that's uh, 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 that's been set and so all, all of the uh, market signals or people don't know what what that basically means is uh, we don't know whether uh, renewables are getting uh, just a small subsidy or a large subsidy so they're basically saying we need basically uh, yeah cert certainty on renewable energy targets uh, carbon pricing uh, for this to be solved and this is the line that's trotted out on ABC insiders uh, uh, pro uh, program and it's also uh, Another problem uh, with getting uh, new uh, coal projects up as well is that the, uh, of course, the the big banks uh, they they love virtue signalling on everything. They won't uh, lend to uh, to coal. So yeah, this is why the uh, the conservatives in the coalition have said like, why don't we have some certainty here? You will guarantee that if you invest in coal, it'll be a it'll come to fruition over the next thirty years. We'll guarantee that. Uh, when labor comes in, they won't uh, shut you down and make it unprofitable. Mm. Well, it wouldn't be nice if they did do that. Unfortunately, there are still too many wets and moderates inside the Liberal Party these days to bring back actual solid direction in policy making, let alone um, fixing the deregulation debacle that has occurred as a result of. <sighs> as a result of very poorly constructed on the run energy policy. And it's interesting now that we're, we're hardly debating the existence of climate change anymore. There's not, uh, I, I, we haven't for a while point, uh, people haven't pointed to the weather and say, see, uh, global warming, climate change. At the moment, everyone's attention has turned to, I just want, cheaper power bills i want reliable <laughs> power and it's uh also reflected in the the polling there was news poll actually did uh, quite a good uh, job this week getting people's opinions on a wide variety of subjects uh, 45 percent of australians want out of the paris climate accord while only 40 percent uh want want to stay and um tony abbott uh, a lot of people thought he's trying to wiggle uh, wiggle where he's way out of because he initially committed to the Paris Climate Accord, but it wasn't completed until Malcolm Turnbull was Prime Minister. He said that it was only an aspirational target, not a commitment. Uh, uh, Julie Bishop said, oh, it's a, uh, it's a commitment. But it, you and I both know that these international treaties or uh, things like that, they're not worth the paper they're written on. I mean, what's, what, uh, what are the global community gonna do? They'll write us a very, very angry letter, Tim, and they will tell us how angry they are. <laughs> no, this, but seriously, though, I mean, I, I know I was being facetious just now when I was quoting Team America, but there's nothing they can do. The international community, they can, they can, they won't put sanctions on Australia because Australia is not only one of the smallest polluters in the world. We were responsible for 1.3% of global emissions last time I checked, of global carbon emissions, 1.3% of that. And even, what's his name, Finkel admitted that if we slashed our emissions by half or even to whatever the target level was, was it 2010, I think, or 2000 or 2010, whatever the, whatever, whatever year it was, it doesn't matter. The point is, what he said was, it is not going to make a difference in the grand scheme of things when India and China and all the other big polluters are still being allowed to pollute. The other contentious policy issue that arose during the week uh, was immigration and population, because we learned through the newspapers, not through some big uh, announcement, that Home Affairs Minister Peter Dutton had managed to cut the annual migration intake for 2017-2018 uh, down to 163,000 uh, people per year, which is a 10-year low. Uh, the ceiling on annual migration is 190,000. Now, it was interesting, earlier in the year, Tony Abbott, when he proposed to reduce the annual migration intake to 110,000, he was uh, ri uh, ridiculed uh, by Scott Morrison and Malcolm Turnbull. And it seemed that because it came from 
uh, Tony Abbott that uh, pe members of the government were automatically against it. But now, a few months later, they've decided to uh, just use his idea a little bit to get population down a bit. So it's mm. not because of uh, Tony Abbott. We've just decided to just do this because we think it's the right thing to do. Yes. It's, it's, I mean, that's politics for you. People will come up with ideas and then other people will claim them as their own, you know, not give you any credit for it whatsoever. I mean, they still haven't, I mean, in fairness, they still haven't reduced it as much as they should have, but at least they have made a start. You know, what was it, 27,000, did you yeah, say? Yeah, uh, or t uh, 21,000 cut from uh, last year. But yeah, mm. a, lo a lot of people have said, still still very high i mean i published an article on monday and most of the comments were like you know good start but there's still a long way to go those are that, mm. those are rookie numbers you've got to get those numbers down <laughs> that's an inversion of the meme but it's true though we do need to get the numbers down and you know i mean this isn't me being anti-immigration this is me pointing out our immigration needs need to be considered in line with our employment rate and with our economy we can't just say, oh, how many people do we need to maintain um, X amount of growth in GDP per annum? And then the then, then Treasury comes back with Y, and then they decide to set the targets according to that. It just doesn't work that way. We need to be more, we need to be more reflective and careful with our policies in terms of immigration. Well, the way that uh, migration works is that the federal uh, government collects all the money that the, the migrants pay in extra taxes, but then it's the, the states who have to basically provide the inf extra infrastructure and services to uh, allow uh, all these you know, migrants to uh, basically be you know, integrated into, in, into the community, which uh, puts a stress on, on their budgets. And as we know with uh, state governments uh, the, between uh, and them and the opposition there's always this uh, political to and fro about which projects will get funding uh, where it's, it's there, there's huge political fights over it and that uh, puts the the, the infrastructure uh, catch up even even further behind mm. it does because the states don't get enough money from Canberra anymore I mean they haven't since the end of World War II but that's also a failure of planning on the part of the states as well. There was an article that came out, a friend of one mine was telling me an article came out in the Fairfax papers yesterday saying that, not saying it outright, but saying that there was a 20 to 25 minute increase in travel time in major cities due to immigrant, um, due to uh, increased congestion brought about indirectly by immigration, which is coming from Fairfax. That says something. That's if my friend wasn't just yanking my chain, though. But looking at the papers this morning, I would not be surprised if that was true. Yeah, and it's it's almost like at the the state level as well, a Ponzi scheme. Like, look at all these extra infrastructure and services we've built. Well, the only reason that we've got more is because you got to keep up with the, the the people who are coming into, and it always falls on uh, Melbourne and Sydney. That's where most of the people uh, s still go, and of course mm -hmm. that leads to other social problems such as uh, crime and uh, other uh, assimilation problems. Well, that's true. It's it, the thing is, and you know, I was, I was a nerd when I was at school. I was, I read this book basically saying, you know, no matter how much you improve the traffic infrastructure, there is always going to be more demand and a more strain put a, on it over time. You'll never truly get rid of the gridlock problem, no matter how much work you do. But you can make a start by not bringing in so many people who are competing with our jobs for one thing and for another thing who are actually going to be able to work and willing to work in rural areas or semi-rural areas rather than just the big cities and our uh, population is due to hit uh, 25 million um, any time now so we are 
I, I remember when I was at school, what our population was about 18 million, which it's basically growing <laughs> by uh, one third during that time. So we are uh, quite a quite a growing uh, nation now. Uh, and um, Liberal Senator Dean Smith, who he's you know not a cons oh, he calls himself a conservative, but most people don't consider him a conservative. So he's called for a parliamentary inquiry into population and immigration, which uh, Malcolm Turnbull has uh, knocked back. But it's it's not an issue that's uh, that's going to go away because 72% of Australians and uh, another uh, well done to, to news poll for asking this question uh, they want an I immigration cut so it's it's an issue that uh, the, the public they they want uh, addressed and this is why uh, Pauline Hansen she proposed uh, we have a plebiscite or postal survey on the question of uh, immigration because it seems our our two major parties are incapable of wanting to address it properly mm. But even if they, do, even if the AEC and the government, 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 sorry, uh, accepted um, Pauline Hanson's idea to have a plebiscite along with the elect next general election, whoever came into power would just ignore it anyway. Oh, I, I have, you, you do that at your peril. I mean, can you imagine if they ignored the the marriage result? Yeah. But they weren't going to because all the people in power wanted it. They weren't going to ignore that vote. I'm just saying you ignore the uh, the public's vote at your peril. Yeah, well, tell that to tell that to the um, tell that to the Liberal Party <laughs> after they um, categorically smacked down that motion to privatize the ABC. Even though it had two two votes to one in favour of it, it was smacked down. Even though two thirds of the council voted in favour of it, the parliamentary party said, "No, nope, not doing it. And go away." So you know, I wouldn't put it past the Liberal Party to, if they somehow by some miracle managed to win the next general election, which I still don't think will happen they will they'll just continue to ignore the people even if their plebiscite any such plebiscite does say let's cut immigration or they'll find some reason to say oh it's not a binding vote now um peter dutton claimed that he was able to get the the migration numbers down because uh, he'd instituted a crackdown on fraudulent claims and there'd been a rise in visa refusals uh, so he basically said that you know we're making sure we get the right immigrants that are useful to us mm, mm. and he has been and to his credit dutton has been a lot more muscular in terms of enforcing the character tests that have been so so badly neglected by the labor government under under rudd and gillard and even to an extent under um howard as well which is one of howard's mistakes that he made every, every government has been for the past 20 years arguably the past 30 years has been neglectful in terms of enforcing the character test uh, and uh, yeah, Dutton is, he's a good head kicker. I mean, that's why he's talked about as the uh, the next or the, the conservative uh, choice for, for prime minister. And yeah, as you, as you said, he said, I've canceled more criminals uh, visas that in the past year than Labor did uh, in the past six years. Uh, <laughs> a lot of those, uh, I should say, New Zealanders. <laughs> well, it's a start. Well, Dutton's made a start, but there's still a lot of work to be done. He needs to. <sighs> I'm going to go after the Quangos. I'm going to go after the Kangaroo Courts, the Administrative Appeals oh, Tribunals. Gosh. I'm going to go do a whole show on that. I know, but I'm going to keep it succinct and say he needs to basically use. He needs to. Use, he needs to cut, kick those down, cut them down, and make it so that they cannot enable anyone who is deemed to be instantly deemed to be a failure on the character test to be allowed to draw out appeals and stay in this country after they've been convicted of crimes they need to shut down the aats 
Now, Bill Shorten's response to this is that he wants a work visa crackdown. Now, I get so confused with the left's views on immigration because obviously the <laughs> unions don't want, you know, foreigners taking people's jobs, but then they want to let in more asylum seekers, uh, uh, open up the, the, the floodgates again. So are you for immigration or not? I, I just don't because get it. Yeah, but because unskilled people are more likely to vote Labour. Whereas skilled people are more Don't they take jobs as well? They all take jobs, it doesn't matter. But Labour's thinking... Labour doesn't care about the workers. Well, Labour doesn't care about the workers since Hawke was in power. Labour only cares about getting itself re-elected, much like the Liberal Party. All they care about is getting re-elected, so they're going to target the demographics that appeal most to them. They're going to fool the people who are unskilled and say, Oh, yeah, yeah, we're going we're gonna to give you a job. We're going to give you a job job we're going to give you good sentiment if you can't get a job so you know you should vote for us and the reason why they want to import unskilled labor rather than the skilled workers on 457 visas is because the skilled workers on 457 visas are generally more likely to vote liberal than labor it is that simple i mean yes i'm being cynical but that it is that simple tim as political junkies like you and me know, uh, the Super Saturday by-elections, it's only a week and a half away. Uh, we're all getting prepped for our big uh, live stream on uh, Saturday 28th of July in the, the evening, but uh, uh, the, both the leaders are now traversing the, the five uh, by-election areas, uh, uh, supporting their candidates, and Bill Shorten uh, even challenged Malcolm Turnbull to a debate, which is not going to happen because Malcolm Turnbull is not going to give Bill Shorten a uh, basically a, a free platform. Mm, exactly. And why would he? There's no reason, there's no benefit to Turnbull to accept Shorten's challenge. And Shorten might have a win saying, oh, Turnbull's afraid to debate me. But the last time Shorten went too hard in the House of Reps, Turnbull humiliated him, and it was actually quite beautiful to watch. Uh, probably the contest which is being most closely watched, and I know, Michael, you're uh, watching it very closely, is uh, Longman, which is in uh, north uh, uh, the Brisbane area. Now, the, there was a bit of a scandal with the, the LNP candidate, uh, Trevor Ruthenberg. He served in the Defence Force. He'd claimed, because he's been a state MP before, it said uh, on the a state government website that he received the Australian Service Medal, which is for overseas service, but he'd only uh, received an Australian Defence uh, Medal, which all people who uh, serve uh, receive and uh, a lot of people uh, jumped on this saying oh is he an imposter but uh, Ruthenberg said oh this was uh, a mistake uh, you know, but it's it's easy to get them confused especially when you're like writing uh, lots of things and he apologized to uh, the Prime Minister the the local uh, RSL this was broken by the Courier Mail and it did make you think for a moment could could we have another fraudster on our hands such as a WA Labor MP uh, Barry Urban, who resigned after falsely claiming he had uh, received a whole bunch of medals. But uh, I, I think that the mainstream media after this would have done some, some digging, and it's just uh, an embarrassment for, for Ruthenberg that he got these two mixed up. Mm. It, it is a big embarrassment, but in fairness, it is a bit of a storm in a teacup. And I'm not saying that to be disrespectful in any way to the military. I'm saying that simply because of the fact that when the his the history of war medals oh sorry defense medals in general they're very ambiguously worded so it is quite possible that he actually just had a blank he just had a mind blank moment and wrote the wrong medal that he received rather than um deliberately setting out to lie mm. Because yeah. the, because the thing is, if you if there was a service medal um, in World War Two, there was a service medal given to anyone who was enlisted or had voluntarily joined the armed forces. That was given from 1939 to 1945. There's the Australian Service Medal of 1939 to 1945. My great uncle received that, although in fairness, he was also posted overseas. But there are a lot of people who weren't necessarily posted overseas who also got that just because they were in there. 
The issue with uh, Big Trev's, um, sorry, uh, Trevor Ruthenberg's. Well, that's his nickname, play. Big Trev. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I know him personally. He's, I actually quite like the guy. Um, I should probably clarify that in full disclosure. But um, uh, when you have very, when you have ambiguous wording for different decorations, it's very easy to make a mistake um, in writing that on the profile. Plus, it wouldn't. I don't think it would have been him who wrote it himself. It would have been a staffer who yeah, most likely. was just told to write it. And if he's dictating the biography to be written on the website to his staffer, the staffer wouldn't have known the difference. And he would have just had a, um, and Trevor himself would have just had a mind blank. So, you know, I don't think it was a fraudulent thing. Hmm. I, I saw Andrew Hasty on the Bolt Report uh, last night, and he's uh, been a, a SAS uh, officer. Uh, mm -hmm. and he said, yes, it's easy to get these two medals confused. And it is a fact that uh, Trevor Ruthenberg did serve in the armed forces. There's, there's no, no other uh, ambiguities in his uh, record. It's just, and and this was left up on state government website for for, for six years. So, pro mm -hmm. probably like those who were you know vetting him inside the the LMP, like they're not going to bother to check out what's on their uh, state government website. No, they're not. And you know, the LMP tends to trust the word of anyone who served in our armed forces because to question it is deemed correctly to be disrespectful. Yeah, definitely. And let's not forget that, you know, the the reason that uh, we're having this by-election in Longman is because uh, Susan Lamb couldn't get her own citizenship work uh, papers in order. And let's not forget she, to try and weasel her way out of it, she lied about being abandoned by her mother at the the age of six with that, you know, mm. like teary speech in Parliament, which we later learnt was not true. Exactly. Well, there's a lot of things you can do under parliamentary privilege. When we were discussing that last week in regards to Senator David Lanhelm, a lot of things can be said under parliamentary privilege and, you know, gotten away with. Yeah, Scot free, as it were. And there's also been some questions as well about the, the One Nation candidate, Matthew Stephen. Uh, he allegedly owes money to uh, business. Uh, associates. So yeah, there's there's been plenty of uh, controversies around the candidates in Longman. Uh, Matthew Stephen, the One Nation candidate in Longman, he has a couple of businesses in the Longman electorate, even though he lives in the Petrie electorate. He has um, been dogged by allegations in the past that he hasn't paid his creditors and that he actually lost his building license. These are allegations. I don't know if they're true. These are just allegations. It must be, must be noted. Um, he has said himself in response to the allegations after other allegations of him losing his building license um, five times in the past seven years that he at one stage only had 54 cents in his bank account and because he's a small business owner, it's very hard for him to balance um, balance books due to the constricting red tape and green tape that comes from regulation. So, you know, I think at the end of the day, I don't think that's going to impact his vote that much. But the interesting thing here in the Longman by-election is not the fact, it's not just the fact that you've got the Liberals... Labor and the Greens and One Nation all running together. It's not even the fact that Blair Verrier is running for the Australian Country Party in its first election outside of Victoria. The interesting thing is that Jim Saleem, also known as Jackboot Jim, and a self-professed self neo-Nazi, is also deciding to put his hand up and run for the... Yes, that's caused a lot of uh, triggering. Is he, like, he's clearly a white nationalist, but is he a, a neo-Nazi? Like, if you, like, asked him, like, would he say that? If we asked him, he might, he might deny it now. But back in the 70s, when he was really active with Ross May, um, I would probably say he would still admit to it then. Then, but not so much now. Um, and this is the other thing, and this is why um, 
a lot of triggering as you put it has happened is because of the fact that Jim Salim has been seen as worse than the Greens when the country party from my information when the country party put Jim Salim last there was a lot of agony over whether to put him above the Greens or put the Greens above I'd him. I'd still put the Greens last. Usually I would agree, but if I'd been there to make that decision, I would still have to, for purely for optics' sake, purely for the optics' sake, put him dead last, even below the Greens, as much as I hate the Greens and as much as they're basically eco-Nazis themselves. <laughs> But when you've got when you've got eleven candidates, ten, eleven doesn't really matter, does it? The issue here is that the unions themselves decided to put him above the LNP. I mean, the unions are a political organization or a parapolitical organization. They actually put Jim Salim above the LNP, and you've got to look at that and think to yourself, what were you thinking? That's because even though preferencing it's. Like, it's always strategy first. Uh, that's how most of the time preferencing works. But it's still seen as the, the how to vote card as a form of virtue signaling. That if you really don't like uh, uh, somebody, you, you know, put them last uh, regardless. Which, um, although, although it's interesting, um, uh, Liberal Party, they haven't put the, the Liberal Democrats who are running in quite a uh, um, couple of their uh, by-elections, they haven't put them <laughs> very highly. No, they don't, because the, L the LDP are competitors for the disaffected conservative and libertarian votes. Interestingly enough, the LDP is running in Longman, as you might know, and the, I think I said it in last week's show, but I'll say it again, Lloyd Russell is more Ron Paul than Gary Johnson. He's actually quite conservative, pro-sovereignty, obviously pro-gun, um, but is very, very conservative, anti-immigration. So he's basically a decent candidate himself. The reason I'm backing Blair, I should say, is because she is very astute and she's a local in the area and has done her best to be active in the community for a long time before she considered running for the seat of Longman this year. The other thing, actually, getting back to Jim Salim, there's one more thing I need to point out, Tim. Um... One Nation claimed that, oh, if Pauline had known who um, Jim Saleem was, she would not have, she would not have authorised him to be put anywhere but last. <laughs> I'm sure she did know who he is. Of course she knew who she was. There are so many photos of Pauline Hanson and Ross the Skull May together. Yeah, go, oh, come on, as if she doesn't know. I mean, how many how many neo-Nazis infiltrated one nation in the very beginning, in the early 90s, in the, sorry, late 90s? There were so many people there who infiltrated. Ross May is still one of her biggest supporters. And Jim Saleem interviewed Ross May. And chances are, after the interview or before the interview, they would have pointed out, oh, yeah, Pauline's really good. We should back her. We should get rid of the Australia First Party and just back her. And the, the fact that for Pauline to say that, oh, I don't know who Jim Salim is, that's crap. That She's lying. She's outright mm. lying. I'm, I'm actually going to go on the record and say she is lying. She has to have known who he was. Yeah. I, I, know, I know who Jim Salim is because uh, I've seen him. Uh, he, yeah, he's not a fan of the, the unshackled, we fail, oh, his, you know, purity test. <laughs> How many times have I heard um, you know, people on the far right say that? See, purity spirals like that, all they do is just punch right and they don't care about who they hurt. They just want to have their own sen their own sense of self-importance and their purity spiraling. And it's just spurging out, basically, for, to put it rather crudely. Uh, anyway, I, I don't think, yeah, even though there is this big shitstorm about people preferencing him, he's not going to get many votes and I don't think that'll affect the outcome at the end. I mean, let's be realistic, it's One Nation preferences, where they go, that'll decide Longman. Mm, that's most likely the case, yes, because uh, Pauline did indicate that she would probably be preferencing the LNP over Labor this time, because of the fact that, well, how do I put this? Susan Lamb lied under parliamentary privilege. So, 
and the fact that Labour has been hammering one, I should say, oh, they have voted with the Liberal Party and the National Party Coalition for, what they first said, 88% of the time? 85% or 88% of the time they've said they've been voting, and Pauline, well, one of her staffers more specifically, put out this, this um, press release of sorts saying, actually, no, because if the Labour Party actually moved policy in the Senate, we would consider voting for it. We can't vote for something if it's not presented as a bill. And that's what it comes down to. So, you know, it's 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 all well and good for Labor to bash one nation, but if they don't have the substance or the reasons for doing so, then they just might look like hypocrites. Well, I think, I still think the LNP will win in Longman, but only just. It's always been a very marginal seat since Mount Brock lost in 2007. Uh, it's always been liberal most of the time, so yeah, I probably agree with your analysis there, but all will be revealed on our uh, Super Saturday live stream special, where it's not just going to be us, we're going to be joined by uh, Stephen Cable from the, the Cable Critique. We've created a Facebook event for it. We're not just going to be on Facebook Live, but hopefully uh, the technology permitting will be on, on YouTube Live as well. It'll be good to be on YouTube Live as uh, YouTube YouTube Live as well. Oh, thanks once again, Michael, for discussing the the week in politics. It's even though it's the the winter break, there's there's certainly a lot to to keep us talking. So thank you again. <laughs> Always a pleasure. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. Lauren and Southern and Stefan Molyneux have touched down in Australia now, and the Unshackled team will be at their first official show uh, here in Melbourne on Friday the 20th of July. They, Lauren Southern just did a North Queensland Young Conservative uh, forum last Monday night, which was good that uh, the, the first event uh, went uh, smoothly. So we'll bring you all the action from both in and outside the, the Melbourne venue, as of course the Antifa and uh, campaign against racism and fascism will be there to counter protest uh, tickets can still be purchased for the other shows in sydney brisbane adelaide perth and auckland by visiting the tour organizer website at axomatic.events Former UKIP leader Nigel Farage is the next big name coming down under in September. He's visiting Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth, Brisbane and Auckland as well. Tickets, including various VIP passes, can be booked at nigellive.com.au. Also, don't forget, if you want to take the Unshackled even further and score some awesome rewards, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash the Unshackled. We can't keep doing this without you, so uh, please consider uh, giving us a monthly contribution. Thank Thanks once again for your company and we'll see you on the next show. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.